Hey, what's up everybody? We are back with another 12 Rules for Life video by Jordan Peterson. Today's video is going to be on Rule 5. If you haven't had a chance to check out the earlier videos, click on the link that will bring you to the playlist containing the first four rules. And so without further ado, I bring to you Rule 5. Rule 5 states, do not let your children do anything that makes you dislike them. Anybody who's dealt with a child that is having a temper tantrum in public can identify with the looks of contempt that passerbys give their child. And so when we start to discipline our children and prevent this type of behavior from happening, we are actually protecting them from being judged by those about us in society. If we don't learn how to say no to our children, then they will not learn the boundaries that are in place in society. And then eventually people will have to micromanage every little action that they do. And so we actually diminish their independence by not putting any kind of structure or discipline in their life. Sometimes we can unconsciously reward our children for bad behavior. He gives an example of a little boy who pushes his little sister to the ground. The mother runs up and picks the little boy up and comforts him and calms him down so that he will no longer behave that way without realizing that she's actually positively reinforcing the behavior that she doesn't want him to do. A son's relationship to his mother teaches him how to treat other women once he gets older and the same with the daughter and their relationship with their father. A mother that doesn't properly discipline their favorite son could add to the gender inequality that is rampant in certain parts of the world. And then he makes an attempt to try to explain why he thinks that this gender inequality has come into existence, historically speaking. Before the modern day population boom and all these medical advances, it was quite common for parents to lose a lot of children in childbirth and in the first years of their life when they were very vulnerable. So to compensate for this, they had to have as many children as possible so that their family line could live on. Men became highly favored in this aspect in places like China because men can have many more babies than women can have in their lifetime. And he gives the example of Yida Schwartz, a Jewish woman who survived the Nazi concentration camps and lived on to, to have a big family. Today, she is the maternal ancestor of over 2,000 people. Now, as impressive as those numbers are, it's nothing compared to Genghis Khan, a ruler in Mongolia who is said to be the ancestral father of 8% of the population in Asia. That's over 16 million people. And so a parent that fails to discipline their son could create quite the little conqueror as he grows older. After all, Genghis Khan was a tyrant and killed millions of people. Now the reverse side of this would be unconscious hate and neglect. And now we don't want that either. If we don't take the favor we show our children too far, then the results can be just what we want. And he uses the example of the famous psychoanalyst Sigmund Freud. Sigmund Freud was the indisputable favorite of his mother. This treatment in the correct portion gave him the confidence and the feeling that he could overcome anything in his life that oftentimes produces real success. From here he starts to draw upon his clinical experience. When he would see his clients for therapy, they would often talk to him about family problems. Now most of them acknowledged the fact that what they were complaining about was relatively trivial in the bigger picture. But he goes on to say that it's not the big things that really get us. It's the small trivial things that we experience on the day-to-day -day basis that add up alarmingly fast. He uses an example here of a child that does not want to go to bed at night. So the parents have to fight with the child for 45 minutes before they can finally get him to go to sleep. 
At that rate of 45 minutes a night, that adds up collectively to 240 hours a year that they are spending fighting with their child. Despite the parents' best intentions, it, they would be hard pressed to not to start to feel some resentment towards that child for the amount of time they spend fighting with them. Or, at the very least, how much time is wasted that could be better spent in some productive way. Then he goes on to attack the idea that children are perfect and infallible and if they do anything wrong, the fault lies with the parents. This is a dangerous road to walk down, he warns. First and foremost, it is unfair to good parents who just happen to have a very difficult child. Parents become afraid to discipline their children thinking that they will screw them up psychologically. But it's this lack of guidance that really screws them up as they grow up and go through life. They don't learn the difference between responsible freedom and the chaos of immaturity and they don't know how to act properly in their day-to-day -day life. And it's this type of thinking that leads one to blame society for our problems as a whole. Society has developed across human history and is so complex that today we don't fully understand why things are the way that they are and why that they work. Now by no means is society perfect, but when we restructure it to try to reach an ideal, oftentimes we end up doing more damage than good. Here he gives an example of the restructuring of the divorce laws in 1960s America. Now before this restructuring, divorce was frowned upon. People were become stuck in bad relationships and if they were forced to get a divorce, oftentimes they would be excommunicated from their communities, which is by no means a good thing. And so the hopeful idealists of the 1960s changed everything by making divorce not so culturally taboo. A result of that has been a divorce rate that has skyrocketed. Almost 50% of marriages end in divorce, and there's countless children whose lives are torn apart in the process. Did they really do more harm than good? This idea of the infallible child was first proposed by the 18th century philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau. His philosophy was that we start out as perfect, clean slates as children and we are only corrupted and become evil as a result of living in a society that is also corrupt and evil. This mythological idea of the divine child is everywhere. It is the potential of youth, the newborn hero, the wronged innocent, the long lost son of the rightful king. It was Adam without sin in the Garden of Eden. Now fundamentally, this idea seems to be wrong because most cases, people tend to get better as the age. The bullying that you see in almost every schoolyard does not exist in adult life. He even cites William Golding's Lord of the Flies as an example, where unsupervised children that end up on an island quickly become savages and start killing each other. Another example he uses to prove that society is not to blame for the capacity of bad and evil that exists within children is the primatologist Jane Goodall, who spent her whole life studying chimpanzees. In 1974, she produced a study that showed that chimpanzees were capable of murdering each other within their tribes. This wasn't just a dispute for territory with another tribe of monkeys. They were actually capable of murdering the people that they lived with on a day-to-day -day basis. Chimps don't live in a modern-day society, so we cannot blame their capacity for evil on that. He also makes the point here that human capacity for self-control may be overestimated. Here he cites Iris Chang's The Rape of Nanking, which is the historical account of the Japanese sack and brutal treatment of that Chinese city. He warns, read this book at your peril. It will give you nightmares. 
Then he goes even further back and states, The hunter-gatherers of the ancient past had very little society. However, their rate of violence and murder were much higher than it is in modern day. So if anything, society has made our capacity for evil to diminish. And so because children are born with this capacity for good and evil, they must be guided, shaped, and informed. We do this by disciplining them when they do not act accordingly and encouraging them when they do. Without this, they cannot thrive in society. The vital ingredient here is attention. If a child lacks attention and lacks guidance, this can be just as psychologically damaging as physical abuse. Fear of conflict and upsetting the child can lead to this lack of attention and lack of guidance. This leaves the child dull and unfocused. They usually are ignored by their peers and even other adults. If a poorly socialized child falls to the wayside, they will become further and further behind their peers. Now some people willfully neglect their children, but more often than not, it's parents who want to befriend their children. They're sacrificing respect for friendship here. A child will have many friends as they grow up, but they only have two parents. And a parent is much more important than a friend anyway. So if we are to play this role as parents, we must learn to temporarily accept the anger and hate that is going to be directed towards us as a result of disciplining our children. We don't discipline out of anger because they misbehaved or disobeyed us. We do it out of mercy. We must use our long-term judgment, which children are not capable of, to determine whether or not a behavior is suitable for a successful role in society. Now this takes a lot of thought and effort, and some people would choose to cop out the moment they hear things like, disciplining your children is pointless anyway because they're just going to act the way that they're going to act and you're best giving them their independence. And on this subject of giving them their independence, studies show that strict limitations actually facilitate creativity rather than inhibit creativity contrary to some popular belief. Children are unconsciously afraid of too much freedom. Oftentimes, they will act out worse and worse in an attempt to provoke some sort of disciplinarian action. Now, when a child acts out and has a temper tantrum, this can be viewed as a display of dominance. If they can get their way, they will, so it is imperative that we do not succumb to the demands a child throwing a temper tantrum makes. Statistically speaking, Two-year-olds are the most violent age group. They hit, kick, bite, and steal to test the boundaries of what they can get away with. If we do not correct them, the child will never learn to control their impulses. After all, the impulses towards aggression exist as part of the human condition. He gives an example here of when his child was young. They did not want to eat their dinner. They would go to bed without having a full stomach and that would cause them to wake up in the middle of the night and start screaming. This would wake the parents up and make them overtired and grumpy and before you know it, the whole house had erupted into chaos. Finally, he decided that it was time for this to stop. He sat his child down and forced him to eat. He had quite the temper tantrum and screamed and cried but all of this was ignored. Time was on his side. After all, 30 minutes to a two-year-old can feel like an eternity. Every time he was able to get him to begrudgingly take a spoonful of his food, he would reward him by patting him on the head and telling him that he was a good boy. When the whole ordeal was over, they both had a better relationship as a result. This is a very important point. 
we want to reward good behavior and we want to avoid rewarding bad behavior. He gives an example here of a child that cannot sleep and constantly gets out of bed. So the parents throw a cartoon on for him so that he will keep quiet and not wake up the rest of the house. In this case, the cartoon is the reward and they are literally training their child not to sleep. Some people are afraid to become a tyrant, so they try to avoid disciplining as much as possible. However, we can oftentimes discipline with reward. The scientist B.F. Skinner was able to teach pigeons how to play ping pong by rewarding them with treats every time they acted the way he wanted. Now, the size of the reward is very important. We don't want it to be too small where it's really not that appealing. But we don't want it to be too big either where it will diminish the value of any other rewards that may come in the future. In our busy day-to-day -day life, just taking some time to give the child some attention can be a reward in itself. Now as good as this all sounds, this only works if the child actually behaves the way that you want them to behave. So unfortunately, sometimes the discipline we must use is negative. Oftentimes, negative emotions teach us much stronger lessons than positive ones do anyway because we want to avoid repeating the pattern that brought them about. So we must balance both approaches. And when we do have to use negative consequences as a way of discipline, we must do it from a position of mercy, not anger, resentment, or revenge. Now keep in mind, as hard as we might try, we cannot shelter our children from fear and pain. However, we can try to maximize the lesson they learn from it. He uses Sleeping Beauty as an example here. After being cursed, her parents make an attempt to protect her from it. As she gets older, she starts to bewail her responsibility when she complains about being betrothed to the prince. This is exactly when Maleficent appears to her and brings her through the portal, where she then pricks her finger on the spinning wheel and falls into a deep sleep. This is symbolic of the overprotected child that cannot live life on life's terms, and failing to integrate into society, develop a willful blindness and a wish for the unconsciousness of their suffering. An example he uses here is a child that never learns to share. A child who does not share will not make friends and will be treated poorly by their peers and even other adults. This will lead to loneliness, anxiety, depression, resentment, and will prevent living life to the fullest. Which just goes to show you, if we don't punish our children in the act however they want out in the world, then society will punish them, and they won't hold back. Children need adults to make their way through the world. Adults are imperfect, so the more adults there are in a child's life guiding them, the better. If the child isn't taught to behave by the age of four, their chances diminish of them successfully changing. It's unfortunate, but true. The problem child is rejected by their peers and other authority figures in society. This lack of attention leads them to fall behind in their development, and the ch other children continue to get further and further ahead of them. This can lead to a teenager being antisocial. Now this seems cruel, but society is formed like this for a reason. We all have to abide by the social contract to behave a certain way so that we can live in a relatively conflict-free world. If we did not abide by this contract, society would quickly erupt into chaos. So then he gives some practical advice about how to best structure your discipline. The first being which, rules shouldn't be created beyond necessity. Bad laws diminish respect for good laws, so we must limit the rules to reduce confusion. We also must use minimum amount of force necessary to enforce that rule. We can start with a warning, and then the punishments can get progressively worse as the preceding ones fail. 
Your rules should be designed to get them to behave properly so they are liked and welcomed everywhere. Every child responds differently, so you must learn what works best for your child. Now, in today's day and age, spanking is frowned upon, but the brain reacts the same when deprived of freedom as it does when we are physically hit. In other words, this deprivation of freedom causes real pain. Obviously, any form of physical punishment must be within reason. But you have to take into consideration the seriousness of the rule violation. He uses the example of a child that runs away from his parents in a crowded parking lot. In this case, the punishment must be whatever gets that behavior to stop immediately. After all, the alternative could be fatal. Now keep in mind, as we get older, society will punish us more severely if we continue to misbehave, so it is best to make the corrections as early as possible. And keep in mind, just telling a child no doesn't work unless it is backed up by some sort of threat. From here he goes on to tackle the no reason to hit a child argument. The first problem he has with this is that it suggests that hitting is all the same. And so context is completely not taken into account here. He gives an example of a two-year-old hitting a baby over the head. Something as simple as a mother flicking the two-year-old in the ear will make the point that what they are doing is not okay. We discipline most effectively when we pair punishment with reward. A perfect example of this would be when a child loses his temper and is put on a timeout, he remains in timeout until he regains control of his emotions. Then he is rewarded by being released from timeout. This works on two fronts. They're being punished for behaving improperly and then they are being rewarded by regaining control of their emotions. Now some children are more difficult than others, and some may need spanking as a last resort, but it's better to do the dirty work yourself rather than let society do it for you, and they will do a much dirtier job of it. So in summary, we want to limit the amount of rules. We want to use minimum necessary force to enforce the rules. Parents should come in pairs. Raising a child is exhausting, and exhaustion leads to making mistakes. It is too much for any one person to handle. And perhaps most importantly, we must understand our own capacity to be harsh, vengeful, arrogant, resentful, angry, and deceitful. Awareness is key here. When a pr we are provoked or disturbed by a child's attempt to dominate us by acting out and having a temper tantrum, it's easy to become resentful and angry and vengeful. So we must plan accordingly and act out on a plan instead of reacting with emotion. And so your primary duty as a parent is to act a proxy of society. We must shape our children in a way that they will be able to successfully integrate into society. And a byproduct of that is happiness, success, self-esteem, and creativity. So in conclusion, a properly socialized child is a positive and engaging individual. Other children are interested and adults appreciate them. They are welcome and receive attention. This will do more for them than anything else. Don't be ashamed to dislike behaviors of your child. Discuss what you like and what you dislike with your partner or friend and family. Take responsibility for the discipline of your child and also take responsibility for the mistakes you are sure to make in the discipline along the way. Nobody loves your children more than you do. If they do something you don't like, they will probably do that same thing to someone else that doesn't love them like you. So protect them by disciplining them. 
And do not let your children do anything that makes you dislike them. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed today's video. Join me next week for rule six. Make sure your house is in perfect order before you criticize the world. If you want to keep up to date on all these 12 rules videos, then make sure to click the subscribe button. In the meantime, take care of yourself. I'll see you next week.